When I left the house, uh, things were in somewhat disarray. And they were in disarray because the partisan politics uh, a few years earlier had taken seed and it was starting to grow. Um, and so the, the dysfunction came about as a result of um, uh, rigid ideology from an element in the Republican Party that was more bluster than strength. Uh, but people started to adhere to it. When I, I remember when I voted a certain way on the Iraq War, there were, um, which we opposed certain provisions of the Bush administration policy in the Iraq War, maybe around 2006, 2007, something like that. And there were probably 20 some Republicans that all voted that way and expressed their um, disagreement with Bush's policy, always saying that the troops were stunningly competent but implementing a flawed policy. And every one of those Republicans got within a day probably a thousand emails angry at them, within one day, and it kept up for several days. And so when we took another vote, something similar, a few weeks later, I assumed that our numbers were still the same, but it dropped from about 20 Republicans to two. And with me losing a primary election, mainly because of my disagreement with George Bush on the policy in the Middle East, um, many moderate Republicans just felt that it wasn't worth their seat. The politics in Washington have sunk to bitter uh, feelings because of ideology and because of re-election and because of a craving for power and because they want to stay in that position. Uh, and it hasn't gotten better yet. In fact, since I left, I would say it has probably gotten worse. Just from what I see with um, the antics that certain people play. For example, when uh, President Obama asked a large contingent of Democrats and Republicans to come to the White House to begin to talk about the health care bill, the whip, who I know well, my good friend Eric Cantor from Virginia, a Republican, brings in the bill. Now, he didn't bring in suggestions. He didn't want to open up a dialogue about how we can make this better. He brought in a bill, and while it was his time to discuss the issue, all he talked about was how big the bill, how complicated the bill is, how much they don't have time to read the bill, and all these things, which was, you know, which was really a waste of time. How do you make public, public policy uh, without reading the bill? No matter how big they are, you can take the time to read that bill. But the Republicans came to that meeting, and they planned prior to that meeting how they would try to disrupt that meeting. And the reason I say that is because I have been in many meetings with Republicans as a Republican member of Congress when they discuss certain, not only just certain pieces of legislation, but that when they would discuss how we can totally disrupt the Democratic majority from the subcommittee right onto the House floor. That's how often, that's how meetings were at times. And I remember one time Secretary Paulson came to us to give us a, a heads up about potential um, economic calamity and we listened to him for 15 minutes and the minority leader John Boehner dismissed Mr. Paulson because we had to get to two things how to continue to disrupt the Democrats in the subcommittee to the House floor and how to raise money for the next election. Now I'm not biased I'm just telling you as if I was a witness telling you what I've observed down there. Or you're not elected to go over there to make phone calls or raise money. You're not elected to go to uh, receptions to discuss these issues with lobbyists. You're not even elected to go home and, and ride in parades. You're elected to go to Washington to, to integrate yourself with your colleagues so you understand each other, to discuss differences of opinions and read, read, read. That's what your purpose uh, to make good public policy is. People's points of view are all valid and all accepted. But when it comes down to uh, my understanding someone's point of view, which I think would make bad public policy, that's in my party, and then I see somebody else that is not in my party, but they seem to have the potential to make good public policy, which way do I go? Uh, part, there's no um, mention of political parties in the Constitution. Uh, but, but as you see, uh, Frank Craddaville's votes, do you feel like 
those would be the votes that you would have been. I, I would have. I would have made different votes than from Frank. Uh, I would have voted for. I would have voted for the health care bill. Yeah. There is no utopia, and there's no icons over there either making legislation. Um, but it was a good step in the right direction. Now. You know, I called up Frank a couple hours before that vote, not to tell him how to vote, or not to tell him how I was going to vote, but I knew that poor Frank, like every other member over there, their guts were, were on fire. It's a wrenching thing to do. It's very, very difficult. Wayne, well, thank you for coming. Okay. We can sort of just get this. I, I can tell you right now, there's no life after Congress. It's just heaven. <laughs> it's just heaven. <laughs>